Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Um, I'll flick this up here if I can. Here we go. So this is session four. Welcome, everyone. We are in the second of five heroes out of the Philokalia. Uh, and this one is St. Maximus the Confessor, who lived 580 to 662. So the start of the 600s would be his era of influencing uh, the church and those around um, his, uh, his cultural neighborhood. His focus is the union of the human and the divine wills, which is what theosis is all about. I'm going to read you a couple of pages on his history so that you know where we're at with uh, Maximus the Confessor. Um, Maximus the Confessor was an exceptionally well-educated Byzantine Christian monk, theologian, and confessor martyr, known for his significant contributions to Christian mysticism and philosophy. He is often celebrated for his defense of the Chalcedonian or Chalcedonian definition of Christology, which argued that Christ had both a divine will and a human will against various heresies of his time, particularly mono, monothelitism, which argued that Christ had only a divine will. This is a, a significant feature of your own theosis when you are a Jesusite, you know, a Jesus follower. You're looking to Jesus and his life and teachings and how he's... Uh, exper expressing and experiencing his union with the Father. Is Jesus only God and God being profoundly other than human? Or is Jesus only human who's in touch with God? Or is Jesus at the same time a human being with a human will and the Son of God with a divine will? This is an argument that went over a couple of centuries and caused um, groups to collect around um, the Pope or around the Emperor and call everybody who disagreed with them heretics. And of course it's just a group of people, a group of men actually, sitting around forming these ideas and, and their various thoughts on it. Uh, just as the so-called heretics would have done also. And it all depends on the measure of Christianity that's in the world at that time because the Christianity we have today bears little resemblance to the Christianity of the first 500 years. In the first 500 years, there was much discussion about, well, who actually is Jesus and what actually is the scope of, of human um, experience and and. and, and is you know when was when was the idea of theosis actually born? It certainly wasn't born in the era of uh, the first apostles. You know they didn't have that that kind of a notion. They had godliness as a notion, but they didn't have the extent that Christianity has pierced into union with God. So Maximus <clears throat> comes along. I thought he was in the three hundreds and four hundreds, but he's not. He's in he's in five hundred. Uh, and predominantly 600, at the same time as Benedict, uh, the Catholic, is producing a <coughs> monastic rule for the, for the Church of Rome and those monks. He is, um, he is a Byzantine Christian monk, and he's obviously a, a very well-educated man, a deep thinker, and he's used to solitary time in God. And so he's recognizing and communicating the virtues of stillness in God and how that produces a godly relationship far better than just going to church, singing the hymns, saying the prayers and going home. So continue reading here. Maximus's emphasis advocated for a two-will theology that underscored the fullness of Christ's humanity and divinity. His writings, including the Ambigua and the Mystagogia, explore themes of divine love, the nature of the human soul, and the relationship between humanity and God. 
due to his opposition to the political and theological pressures of his time, he suffered persecution, including exile in Georgia and torture to prevent his communicating by the removal of his tongue and the amputation of his right hand. Uh, after his exile to Georgia, uh, to a monastery there, he and his torture there, he died soon after. Maximus was vindicated by the third, but of course, in his death, he, he would have realized that he had already put out the truth of Christ in himself and the Father in himself and the theosis union that he would have enjoyed. He, he would have already written that, it would have been circulated, it would be out there. So to his mind, so what? Father, I'm coming to you. Who cares? You know, I've, I've, done, I've done your will in the world. This is how the world re relates to it. But generations from now, they'll understand it and they'll take it on board. He died soon after. Maximus was vindicated by the Third Council of Constantinople, the Sixth Ecumenical Council, 680 to 681. They're actually hardly ecumenical. By the, after the Third the third ecumenical council. It was then just actually a group of men coming and persecuting somebody. You know, there wasn't much ecumenical about the whole deal, but they call it, they still call it the sixth ecumenical council, which declared that Christ possessed both a human and a divine will. With this declaration, monothelitism became heresy. That is, Jesus has got only one will. Maximus was posthumously declared innocent and soon after was beatified a saint. Both the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic traditions honour this to this day. Christianity, of course, in the Protestant realm, uh, barely acknowledges saints. Only in the High Anglican sort of thing do you have saints. His thoughts have a lasting impact on Christian theology, particularly in the areas of mysticism, and the understanding of the divine human relationship. Mysticism isn't sorcery and isn't wizardry. Mysticism is the word given to the intimate relationship whereby a human connects to God and God's energies, and there is a transformation in the intelligence and also the sense of being in a person. So then we start to have a look at his works. When the Persians conquered Anatolia, Maximus was forced to flee to a monastery near Carthage. It was there that he came under the tutelage of St. Sophronius and began studying in detail with him the Christological writings of Gregory of Nazianzus and Pseudo-Dionysius, the Aeropagite. Now this is valuable to know. Where does a person get their teachings from that enables them to have the experience that Maximus the Confessor is writing about. And this is the same for you. When you read somebody, listen to somebody, what's, what's the root of their, their experience? Who have they listened to? Who have, who's tutored them? Who's mentored them? Where are they coming from that they have their particular slant on life? And this is what makes up the diversity of human um, conflict and human creativity. Where does a person get their information from? And so for those people who disagree with St. Sophronius or disagree with Gregory of Nanzianus or disagree with uh, Pseudo-Dionysius, then they'll disagree with St. Maximus the Confessor. It's just stock standard. And then you ask yourself, well, who do they agree with? You know, who are their sources? And if you get some bozo who says, no, I just thought it up myself, well, the chances are pretty good that it won't be very complete. And so when somebody like Maximus the Confessor um, draws from uh, St. Sophronius and then the earlier teachings of, of Gregory and Pseudo-Dionysius, you'll find that what's happening is not only is there a piercing into God like this, but at the same time as a piercing, there's a broadening out so that the depth of what you find in God is able to cover all souls and all people's interests. Now, in the 500s and 600s, that was still very ethnic central and it was still very cultural, um, culturally encoded. Um, eventually, you know, 400, 500 years later, you'll find that the Church of Rome splits because now they want to put the Pope, or the Pope wants to put the Pope as 
the governor of all Christianity in the whole world, and that doesn't go down well with everybody else. And then 500 years after that comes a split from the Catholics, who, uh, again, it's around the Pope and papal authority, and, and Protestantism is formed. Uh, it would have been a good time for them to revert back to loyalty with the existing Orthodox, you know, the pre-let's honour the Pope kind of Christianity, but there you have it, it went, it went um, viral across Europe and, um, and didn't include the Eastern European and didn't include the Middle Eastern styles of worship. We find the writings of Maximus the Confessor in volume two of the Philokalia. This is volume two. When you're reading the Philokalia, you'll find that uh, each book is a self-contained anthology of one or two or three of the fathers of the church. And, and they're not spread across the whole, the whole book. The, the text like this, put together by Palmer, Sherrod, and Callistus Ware, have been very well uh, orchestrated uh, so that you, you can read one particular author's works um, and, and sink into them without having to navigate all of the other books at the same time. We find the writings of Maximus the Confessor in volume two of the Philokalia, 400 texts on love. This, this is what this contains. 400 texts on love, 200 texts on theology and the incarnate dispensation of the Son of God written for uh, uh, someone who's requested this, Thalossius. Various texts on theology, the divine economy, and virtue and vice, and on the Lord's Prayer. And I've taken today, I've taken the three lessons that we're going to look at on Maximus Confessor from what he's writing about on the Lord's Prayer. If somebody says to you, tell me about the Lord's Prayer, you'd probably finish it in a one-page email. But... Uh, Maximus has got, I don't know, 20 pages on it or more. You know, it, it just goes on and on. And the one thing about the Orthodox that has been said is that they cover everything. They leave nothing out. And so with Maximus Confessor, you need only grab a half a dozen of his 400 texts on love, for example. We, we did one of those in our, in our Lords uh, this morning that... Um, and it just sounds like ordinary stuff to us. But you've got to remember where he was in the 600s and what was happening in the church and the biases and the hypocrisies and the, and the fight against heresies and you know, the, the establishment of one organization above all other human beings, all of this stuff being navigated. It was early days and now we're in an era where all of that is wanting to be absolutely dismembered and, and, and fragmented back to original things that involve every single human being. Well, that didn't exist in his day. You, you weren't an, an every single human being. You belonged to this club or that club, and if you had an argument between the clubs, then you had a war, and that was it. Or you were a heresy, or you, were, you, know, you had your hand cut off and your tongue taken off. I've got something little here. Moreover, you should know Father Epidos that these chat oh this is what he he writes i'm going to read it from the bigger screen here and this is really valuable to know so here is maximus the confessor and he's a, he's a serious piece of authority and after he's he's dead he's made a saint because everything that he writes about is now considered to be actually true by someone else not those who butchered him moreover you should know father uh El Pidios, that these chapters are not the products of my own mind. On the contrary, I have gone through the writings of the Holy Fathers and collected from them passages relevant to my subject, condensing much material into short paragraphs and in this way making it easy to remember and to assimilate. And this is the sign of your own spirituality. Um, and the truth of it, when Jesus came, for example, there's, there's almost nothing that Jesus um, brings into his teachings that is original revelatory data from someplace other than the scriptures and the, and, and the Sadducees and, and the, um, the Jewish tradition that he's in. 
he's ministering to it. And so he's drawing from all of the scriptures and even declaring, I am the fulfillment of all these scriptures. He's drawing from them all to make a new point, to lift that group of people up. And through that group of people, having other people coming afterwards who will lift up the rest of the world. That's, that's the way that it happens. So this is a very humbling feature about your own understanding of yourself. Where do you get your information from? Where do you get your intelligence from? And you'll find no one is an island. No one is, no one is an item unto themselves that's got you know, some, some great revelation to the whole world that hasn't been brought about by standing on the shoulders of other people beforehand. So it's, it's a very valuable thing to recognize as it is for you, so it was for Maximus the Confessor. <coughs> Pardon me. And a big part of following these, these fathers of the church, these saints, through the Philokalia is not only to know what they thought and the circumstances of their thinking and, it, and their thinking's influence on people, but how does that make you who you are in Christ and in God? And how is that all contributing to your theosis? So you're, you're not just an isolated individual frog in an extremely large pond and you couldn't care about anything else. You actually want to know what the pond is like. And who else is in? We just got, had a frog turn up in our pond recently out the back here, which Sister Irene sleeps above the pond. So, of course, she's very aware when the frog turns up in the middle of the night because all night she's got... <laughs> saying, I wish you'd stayed in the forest. But of course, that little frog's calling out for another frog to mate. We've got a peacock on the property, the same thing, calling out for a female peacock to come up and join him. Hey, great food. We've got plenty of shelter. No one's shooting us. Come on up here, girls. Come on up here. None have come up so far. But, you know, you're calling out. But then there's the big fish, and there's the little fish in the, in the pond. There's all the grasses, the whole ecology of it all. And so as we grow in our theosis, we can dive really, really deep into God. But that wears out. And you find that from your position of depth in God, God now brings things into your life that now expand you so that you can know the whole context of where you are in God. And this is the opening of the root of theosis inside of you up until you up until that happens in you you are what i would call a candidate for theosis but once you've found yourself in god through christ you this godly woman this godly man now start to expand your horizons without losing god without losing the originality of god in yourself and without falling off into some other religion or, or whatever. You know, you can, you can explore all, all sorts of things. All, you can explore all the other religions, all the other cultures, whatever. But you are doing it now as a person in God. And as you do this, you are increasing the breadth and the depth and the height of your theosis. And this is particularly true when you come across other very, very godly people in whom you can recognize God's theosis work and they're better than you. They know more about the theosis journey than you. And you think, oh, glory to God, look at that. You're not, you're not number one on the stack. There are those who have gone before you and there are those following after you. And all of this then becomes the journey into the fullness of your theosis. And on the planet Earth here, there's a limit to that. There's only so much you need before your theosis is complete. And then your heavenly citizenship starts to fall upon you. It starts to, to rise up in you and it falls upon you like a, like a heavenly rain. And you start to realize that God is opening up to you the energies of heaven beyond the earth for you to now start to incorporate them in your thinking and in your projects and in your planning and in what you do, even what you do every day. And your heavenly citizenship starts to open up. But it can only open up if you've got a breadth of theosis with you already. It can't open up to 
a narrow point of contact with God because heaven is not a narrow point of contact with God. Heaven is you know, trillions and billions of years of exposure to life in God. You know, they've, they've gone past that little opening series. So let's have a look now and, and see what we're doing here. Looking at key points one to four out of the ten that I've identified for Maximus the Confessor, the first one of them is theosis, synergy, and overcoming passions. Theosis, what it is to actually have unity with God. Synergy, the, the f flux of energy that, and what you become as a result of that and what God was able to do as a result of that. And overcoming your passions. Um, at the same time, it's really valuable when you think of overcoming your passions, not to become some stalactite, you know, not, not to become immovable like that. Your passions are a part of you, but the ones that separate you from God or the ones that pull you down into the materiality of life, that blur God or reshape your relationship with God or, or, or do separate you from God, these are the ones that overcoming the passions is dealing with. You might have a passion for playing chess. You might have a passion for making cheese. You might have a passion for, for um, gardening. I, you know, I, I enjoy gardening very much. If, if, I, if gardening was taken away from me tomorrow and I couldn't garden, that's, that's cute. I'll just enjoy someone else doing the gardening. It's, um, you know, it's not something that you... But, but no one can take God away from me any longer. It's, it's, too, it's too much a part of me who I am. So, let's have, a, let's have a look at these sorts of things. I've, I'm starting off here with um, point one, theosis deification, is a statement about what it is, as far as Maximus the Confessor is concerned. And then I've got a statement, and this one comes from his book Ambigua, and then I've got a biblical statement that backs this up. After this page, we'll go into his teaching on the Lord's Prayer and have a look at how he brings out of the Lord's Prayer these elements, theosis, synergy, and overcoming passions. So, um, Guido, could you read this first page for us, please, theosis, in the blue? <coughs> yes, I will. Theosis, deification. The ultimate goal of the Christian life is to become partakers of the divine nature, or theosis, which is a gradual process of transformation into the likeness of God. A sure warrant for looking forward with hope to the deification of human nature is provided by the incarnation of God, which makes man God to the same degree as God himself became man. Ambigua 7.22 But which have been given to us exceedingly great and pre precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. To 2 Peter 1.4 so you can see that this is the foundation. The scriptural foundation for deification is actually pretty flimsy. The Bible is not really a course book on how to become God. It's got stages of the growth and the development of godliness, but it's even through Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and all the letters that follow it, there's really not a whole lot that's describing the measure of theosis that men and women have enjoyed um, I would say, p particularly in the last well, thousand years, um, the desire and the faith for theosis has formed the Carthusians. It's formed the Cistercians among the Catholics. Um, it's formed um, uh, spirituality to deal with the Arab invasion in, in the Middle Eastern countries. It's formed... Um, a rethinking of loyalties to uh, major church movements such as occurred through the Protestants 
to the point now that there's a, a gazillion Protestant churches that don't have links to anybody. They just, you know, Pastor Fred and his flock. What comes to mind in this, however, is this question. What do you personally, right now, need to focus on most so that you can partake of the divine nature as Peter writes about it 2300, 20, 2100 years ago and as it's called this godliness that Maximus the Confessor is talking about in his book Ambigua which makes man God to the same degree that God himself became man. The question is, what is it in your life right now, a blessing, an increase, that adds to your life right now more of what Jesus was with the Father, knowing that Jesus came into his ministry years fully identified in the Father. There was full theosis functioning in the Father. And when he was a 15-year-old kid, it might not have been like that. As an 8-year-old kid, it certainly wasn't like that. As the human will developed in Jesus, it would have peaked at a point where both Jesus and the Father recognised now's the time where the two of us can securely go out and represent humanity and represent God in the same action, the same word, the same movement into society, and there is no falling back. There's no Jesus has a bad day with the Pharisees and he, he, he gets, he mopes and he, gro he, he groans and he gripes and says, oh no, this is rubbish, I'm going over to, I'm going over to Jordan for a couple of, couple of weeks and, and, and uh, just have some time out, chill out by myself. And I'm, I'm not sure that I'm doing the right thing here. And I'm like, this is rubbish. There's no falling back into that. There's a total commitment to God. And he's got to work through all of the ideas that are thrown at him from the people that he meets and the people who engage him and question him and especially the torment coming out of the Jerusalem authorities who are challenging him at every every turn. There's no retreat from that. Why? Because there doesn't need to be a retreat from that. Because the presence of God and the presence of Jesus are so synthesized that that's simply how it is for Jesus now. So this is the starting point of his ministry. This is the point at his baptism where the Holy Spirit comes and confirms, yeah, this is where we're at right now and this is how it's going to be until Jesus leaves planet Earth, leaves the world. And so what is it that Jesus has with the Father that the Father and Jesus Christ himself in you know, oh yeah, my kid could really benefit from this now. That's a really good question, and one that you could probably ask every couple of months. And you set that up as your theosis project. You become a Jesusite, you know, you, you, you're looking to Jesus and his theosis exclusively. And you're, and you're appealing to the inward manifestation of the spirit of truth inside of you to deliver exclusively his kind of blessing to you in this way. And that way, you've got a clear focus for your theosis journey. If you read Philokalia, if you read the Desert Fathers, if you read any of the ancestral texts here, you'll find that they are speaking now to your project. You're not trying to become them. You're inspired by them, but you're becoming your own theosis person. And maybe that might be something that God reckons, oh, yeah, this would be good for my kid to have, that they can get totally on the page that their life is about their theosis and I am their strength and we are heading toward Jesus' baptism.
We're heading toward Jesus' baptism as it was for Jesus. We are full on into deification. Whether you're going to become a worldwide evangelist or a monk or a priest or, or, or a nun or a pastor or just stay at home and knit socks, uh, that's purely up to you. It's, there's, no, there's no gradation here. It's just who do you become when you and God are 100% aware of being one? That's the point at Jesus when Jesus starts his, his ministry. And his ministry never ever wavers from that. You know, you don't see in, in, in even the writing of the Gospels, you don't, sit, you don't see the time where he sits down and, and has a good falafel and says, oh, can you please pass me more tahini? You know, you, you don't see this part at all. The Gospels are purely written about how he is all the time focused with God. But for us, as for Jesus, it's our choice how much tahini we want in our falafel. And that's a part of the breadth of our life. And it's a narrowness of our life if we say, oh, no, no, I, I, I only eat a half a falafel and I never have tahini on it because that is my asceticism and that's what keeps me anchored in the Lord. Well, that's cool, but you will outgrow that. You know, you'll, you'll outgrow and you'll become friendly. Heavenly Father... I've spoken this wish into the, into the air, into the atmosphere. Come now to your child. Holy Spirit, bring your child right now into the depths of communion with the Father within them so that they might hear the Father's word and be inspired by the Father's relationship with Jesus and Jesus' relationship with the Father. Over and above any church conflicts and any religious conflicts, just the personal theosis journey, Father. And I'm going to count from five back to zero, back to one, Father, back to one. And then, Father, at your leisure, take your time and bring, bring this, bring the mindedness together with your child. And during that counting, speak a word to them about what will enhance their theosis so that they can focus on that in their everyday life. Five. Four. Three. Two. your hand up when you've got your word from God. It's pretty easy and straightforward, isn't it? So this is what Maximus the Confessor says. That if you'll come into the intimate presence of God within you and form relationship like this, but have the view that you are growing into perfect union, inseparable union, the same that Jesus had, that this is what Christianity is all about from start to finish. There is no, oh, let's grow into this from start to finish. This is what it's about. And you can ask any, any child who's got a love for Jesus, baptised or not, got a love for Jesus. They'll have this sense of, yeah, this is what it's about. When they get baptised and they come into the workings of the church and so on, they get to put some flesh on the bones. But essentially, this is what it's about. So you've got your project now. I would imagine that you could also put your hand up if I said, and don't you feel a little bit transformed right now? Don't you feel like you've got a bit of a victory there? You know, you've, you've been led out of the woods, you know. The, the, the great curtain has 
been split and you've got a way forward now. I certainly have. I've been struggling with an issue for a month and it's gone. I got it. Thank you, Father. Because you now let your theosis do its work in you, in your mind and in your thinking. And this is what Maximus the Confessor is wanting to get across to people who hear him. That your theosis mindedness is transforming and it will find a way for you. So come into union with the Father, bring your prayer and your thoughts to the Father and expect that you and the Father together are going to then create your solution and walk through it together. This is Jesus' theosis. So simple. So simple. So you're selling water by the river. You know? Alessandra, would you read this? And there's another page after this one, just a little bit after it. If you'd read this for us, please. If the purpose of the Divine Council is the deification of our nature and the aim of Divine Thoughts is to supply the prerequisites of our life, it follows that we should both know and carry into effect the power of the Lord's Prayer and write about it in the proper way. And since you, sir, in writing to me, your servant, have been inspired by God to mention this prayer in particular, it is necessarily the subject of my own words as well. Hence, I beseech the Lord, who has taught us this prayer, to open my intellect so that it may grasp the mysteries contained in it, and to give me words equal to the task of elucidating what I've understood. For hidden within a limited compass, this prayer contains the whole purpose and aim of which we have just spoken. Or rather, it openly proclaims proclaims his purpose and aim to those whose intellects are strong enough to perceive them. Continue on this page, please. The prayer includes petitions for everything that the Divine Logos affected through his self-emptying in the Incarnation, and it teaches us to strive for those blessings of which the true provider is God the Father alone, through the natural mediation of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, for the Lord Jesus is mediator between God and man. As the divine apostle says, since he makes the unknown Father manifest to men through the flesh and gives those who have been reconciled to him access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. It was on their behalf and for their sake that without changing he became man and is now the author and teacher of so many and such great new mysteries as yet beyond our understanding. Thank you very much. The thing that comes to mind as he's writing his precursor here to this, um, this man that he's, he's responding to, um, who's, who's written to him asking for some teachings, and he's, uh, in, in his reply he's cottoned on to, well, I'm going to say something about the Lord's Prayer, and he's elucidated the Lord's Prayer. The thing, the thing that Maximus the Confessor is noted for is that you can't have theosis unless you know that Jesus was a human being who had a perfect relationship with God and the synergy between the two, between God and, as he calls his, his God, Father, the synergy between the two of them is the thing that he imparts to the human believer, to the Christian believer, the Christ-like believer, as, as Paul. Paul coins that word, you know, that the, the first church people call that word Christian. If you've got a community of people who are not quite sure whether Jesus is human or only God, in other words, there's no human part in it. He was God all along. And the idea is that when he was crucified, he felt nothing, he did nothing because he was just God, you know. Then comes the, the argument, well, 
how can I be like Christ? And the desire inside of me is to be like Christ. How does it all work? So there are a couple of hundred years of this working through these ideas. And so when you think for yourself, who actually is Jesus? Is Jesus just Jesus of Nazareth, the human boy of Mary, who happened to be very godlike? Or is Jesus the Son of God who miraculously came into the Virgin Mary, was born and lived purely by the grace of the Holy Spirit all his life and was never affected at all by the human struggles that we have? Or was Jesus a mixture of God and a human being? And if that's the case, in what way can I have what he had with the Father? And if you, if you think through this and you discount that Jesus was God, such as the Muslims do, such as the Jews do, such as Buddhists who ever come to find out about Christianity do and Hindus do, that God is God and Jesus is Jesus, if you discount that Jesus was God, then not only does some of the gospel teaching itself not make sense, it's, it's like it's just written incorrectly, but it doesn't give you anywhere to go. You're just left with a God that you have got no contact with. But as Maximus the Confessor is saying, for the Lord Jesus is, is mediator between God and men. He makes the unknown Father manifest to men through the flesh. So the value of knowing that God became mortal and took Jesus' form, Jesus' life, became Jesus, it's really valuable so you then get a perfect model of the theosis that happened to a human being. And if you look back into the Jewish annals of history and say, well, why did God do that? The Jewish story or the story that comes out of the Jewish annals is that man inherited sin from Abraham and, and Eve, uh, from uh, Adam and Eve. And God's way of bringing humanity out of that sin was to show them theosis the theosis that rightfully should have been Adam's and Eve's anyway. Show them theosis so that they can then, that humanity can then see a living example of this. And the only way to do that was not to make a human being have the fullness of theosis, but for God himself to demonstrate that. Not only to demonstrate that, but to give to you an ongoing internal help and in John's Gospel, uh, John, John uh, 14, 15, 16 speaks about Jesus after he's left, after he's left his physical body. And you're going to have this help of the spirit of truth. It's called in one instance, in another instance, it's called the Holy Spirit. And this helper inside is going to show you the way to Jesus' theosis. He's not going to show you how to be a good Catholic or how to be a good Orthodox or how to be a good Protestant alone without the underlying purpose being he's going to show you theosis. So this is the value that Maximus the Confessor is bringing to the church of the 600s. It all might be a bit boring for you, but if you inspect all of this, you'll find that this is what actually is, has been established in you at the level of understanding your theosis. You can't give theosis to a person with no brains. They have to be able to have the intelligence of, of the uncreate mind of godliness. Um, Stephanie, can you read this page for us, please? And this is taken from page 287 out of this one here, out of book two. So it's a direct copy out of there. So this is what he's writing now. The Logos has made men equal to the angels. 
Not only did he make peace through the blood of his cross between things on earth and things in heaven, and reduced to impotence and hostile powers that fill in the intermediary region between heaven and earth, thereby making a festal assembly of earthly and heavenly powers, a single gathering for his distribution of divine gifts, as humankind joining joyfully with the powers on high in enormous praise of God's glory. But also, after fulfilling the divine purpose and undertaking on our behalf, when he was taken up with the body which he had assumed. Continue. He united heaven and earth in himself, joined what is sensible with what is intelligible intelligible, and revealed creation as a single, always extremes are bound together through virtues and through knowledge of their first cause. He shows, I think, through what he has accomplished mystically, that Logos units unites what is separated and that alienation from the laws divides what is united. Let us learn then to thrive after the laws through the practice of the virtues, so that we may be united not only with the angels through virtue, but also with God in spiritual knowledge through detachment from created things. He says a little bit here in this passage that is really summed up in the last part, uh, in the last sentence here, where his his asceticism is saying, let's let's not let's let's be free of created things, let's let God's word inside of us unhook us from any attachments we've got to things, so that we can progress in our theosis, in our union, and he's calling the Logos, of course, the Word of God, uh, which is Christ, uh, as Christians use the word Christ, um, that Christ is the one who um, supports all life at, at every level and deals with the negative, deals with the demonic, deals with that which opposes God at the realms between earth and heaven and is the truth that in the Word of God, a person will be united with God and be united with everybody else and with reality, with, with the nature of life. And that if a person is separated from that, then they'll be out of sync with life. You know that from New Age studies and body, growth, body work studies and so on, especially since the, the early 1970s, um, as people started to experience that, that a big part of spiritual growth outside of the purely religious features of, of spirituality had to do with consciousness. It had to do with what's going on inside of your body, what's going on inside of your environment. If, if something is failing in your environment, is that a feature also of your body? And if, you're, if you fix your environment, does it also help to fix your body? Or if you fix what's going on in your body, does it help you to deal with what's happening in your environment? So there is this synergy that's very holistic. And what Maximus the Confessor is saying, which he doesn't have the experience of 30 years of personal growth development that's, that's in the world today, or certainly in the Western world today. Well, it's in the, it's in the Eastern world, it's in the Hindu world, it's in, it's in the medicines and the herbologies of all of these, these traditional nations. Uh, regardless of their spirituality, he doesn't have, he's not using the words and he doesn't, probably doesn't have access to that sort of science in his day. But he's very aware that in Christ there is a unifying power 
And what I find up here in, in the wilderness of, of the west of, of North New Zealand is that if somebody, and it happens regularly, where somebody will meet me in the street or in the supermarket or some shop and ask, what actually am I doing dressed like this and what's the costume for and all this sort of thing, what I find is that the, the unifying fact of, of the word, of, of the logos, immediately looks to uplift that person and unify that person in more of God for their sake so that it's in God that we meet and it's in God that we're unified. And this is the very thing that you'll find this in your own life. Let's, let's have a look at this right now. Heavenly Father, I want you to find one person in the life of your child who's watching this or participating in this with whom they need a unifying reality to happen. They're not unified with this person to the degree that their theosis could benefit from. Bring to mind that person right now, Lord. And now, Father, plant the seed in their theosis, whereby this unification will come about by the grace of God for the well-being of both this person and this other person in their theosis journey. Plant that right now, please, Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. And open a way for that to happen through the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Robert, are you able to, um, <clears throat> to read the last two pages we've got here, please? You might just be recording it. All right. Um, Sister Irini, would you read this one, please? Um, page 288. The Logos enables us to participate in divine life by making himself our food in a manner understood by himself and by those who have received from him a noetic perception of this kind. It is by tasting this food that they become truly aware that the Lord is full of virtue, Psalm 34, 8, for he transmutes with divinity those who eat it, bringing about their deification, since he is the bread of life and of power in both name and reality. He restores human nature to itself. First he became man and kept his will dispassionate and free from rebellion against nature, so that it did not waver in the slightest from its own natural movement, even with regard to those who crucified him. On the contrary, it chose death for their sake instead of life thereby demonstrating the voluntary character of his passion, rooted as it is in his love for humankind. Second, having nailed to the cross the record of our sins, he abolished the enmity which led nature to wage an implacable war against itself, and having summoned those far off, and those near at hand, that is, those under the law and those outside it, and having broken down the obstructive partition wall, that is, having explained the law of the commandments in his teaching to both these categories of humankind, he formed the two into one new man, making peace and reconciling us through himself to the Father and to one another. Our will is no longer opposed to the principle of nature, but we adhere to it without deviating in either will or nature. The value of Maximus the Confessor is to take what he's just written and read it and reread it and reread it 
or read it aloud and record your voice reading it aloud and play it to yourself over and over and over and over again until it's so deep inside of you that you in your theosis are now listening to it and agreeing with it. What he's just described is the very way or one way of describing the very way that theosis comes about through Christ and through, through Jesus' activities on his cross and in after his cross. The point to make out here is that if somebody says to you, will you die for these people, for the sins of these people? You've got a choice of saying, well, do I want to die or not? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And, and you know, let's hope that something works. But for Jesus, his death is full of value. His death, as, as um, Maximus the Confessor says, his death is taking all of human capacity for sin, sin's done and sin's potential, taking all the capacity to be separated from God and therefore not participate in the theosis project at all, to take all of that into its inevitable conclusion, which is death of the person, to take it in there and to come out of that victorious and to show himself alive and then to take himself back into his God position as the, as the word, as the, as the son of God, so that he can now enact that in the life of every human being. The human being until they become a believer and the human being as a believer and after they're a believer and the human being as they get a craving for the same theosis that Jesus had himself in whatever culture and language they've got. And here is Maximus the Confessor describing that process. And this is something that's valuable for you to have within your own theology, your own understanding of how, how does it work between you and God. And if you don't understand how it works between you and God, when God is with you, you'll simply become silent. There will be no moving parts inside of you. And when you come out from that and engage life, not much has changed. You'll just be silent. But what life asks of you is to be able to speak into it, to say something. Imagine, imagine turning up to some person that you have great respect for and you're waiting for them to personally give you a word to help you and they just sit there in silence, you know, like the Buddha who raises a flower. And then, you know, that, that's cute, but it'd be really nice to, having raised the flower, talk to me as raising the flower nest, please. You know? <laughs> and so it's really valuable to go through Maximus the Confessor, as the same with all of the Philokalia. Not all of the Philokalia is written at the same level of theology or, or, or theosis. It's, there, are, there are different levels, three, at least three different levels in it. And, um, and they, they are, they are the, the beginner level, the introductory level. Then there's the purification level that, that happens in a person in this first level. And then there's the illumination level where you, you now start to have God actually in your intellect and in your mind. And your mind starts to become clear and, and becomes clear light. Is, is the only way to describe your mind. And then after that comes the theosis itself, comes the actual union with God. So you've got purity, you've got illumination, and then you've got your theosis, this union. And Maximus is talking from this third position. Well, the Philokalia speaks from these three different positions as well. So it's a valuable thing to continue looking at Maximus the Confessor, go online and, and pull down, for example, his, his Lord's Prayer and, um, and have a read through it. And as you think about it, you can think about it objectively as a concept and you can also relate to what's happening in yourself with God. And the more that you give yourself a theosis framework for your own life, the more your theosis will become real in your life. If you hold on to an earlier version of yourself or 
a partial version of yourself, you'll find that your theosis will not grow as fast as you want it. It's like you're keeping a potted plant within a, its original pot that you got from the nursery and its roots are all hanging out, but you're trimming off the roots, you know, and you think, <laughs> you know, naughty plant, you shouldn't have roots hanging out the bottom here, you know. No, 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 it's, it's telling you, give me a bigger pot, give me more soil to grow in, like that. All right, so that's it for um, the first one of these three. That's the first one of Maximus the Confessor. We'll pick it up again next week. God bless you all. I love you all. Thank you for being here. I know you're blessed. And enjoy that feature that the Father said, yeah, this is the next, this is a thing that will enhance your, your theosis. And now watch it happen. Watch it, it'll just come about in your life, like, because God's will and your will are a single will in your theosis. Your theosis will make it happen in your visible world around you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Ciao. God bless.